from Cape Kennedy launched uh, Canaveral Air Force Station, went about 100 miles up, 300 miles downrange, and splashed into the Atlantic. That was it. That was it, like a very short commuter airline flight from <laughs> here to LaGuardia or something. He was airborne for 15 minutes. So even though we've technically put someone into space, we haven't remotely caught up with the Soviets yet. And that three weeks after that, three weeks after that little chip shot, we still haven't orbited anyone yet. You know, President Kennedy makes his famous I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. So let's talk about a little bit how much he was sticking his neck out when he said that. Apollo had already started, but it, Apollo was a very vague program at this point. Are we going to go to the moon? Are we going to orbit the moon? We don't even know if we're going to land. It was not very well defined. Uh, John Glenn had not orbited the Earth yet. Apollo would require a huge booster, the Saturn V at least, which wasn't even a gleam in Werner von Braun's uh, eye at this point. We had started to make studies of a two-man uh, Mercury. In fact, that's what it was called at that point, was just a Mercury Mark II. But then they decided to name it Gemini, and it was going to be this new program to demonstrate technology and procedures which were required for Apollo, which would be very, very significant. And they named it Gemini and unveiled it in January 1962. So just to talk about where we are when Kennedy made this statement. So Al Shepard is in this little one-man capsule. He does this little chip shot in this Mercury Redstone booster. John Glenn <coughs> would be upgraded a little bit in this Atlas booster, so <coughs> on the Mercury capsule. This is Gemini, which doesn't exist. We just announced the program. And this is what's required to go to the moon. Wow. This is what's required to go to the moon in less than nine years. And all we've demonstrated is this. Wow. <laughs> you know, so, so think about it. The, the guts Kennedy had, and, and NASA and the country to, to follow it up. Okay, so October 57 Sputnik, NASA was created in response in 1958. The Apollo program very loosely defined in July 60. Uh, Vostok 1 with Gagarin, Freedom 7, JFK speech, Project Gemini, and then John Glenn finally orbits the Earth uh, February 1962, almost a year after Gagarin. So we choose to go to the moon, but how are we going to get there? This is, this is a very significant aspect as it relates to Gemini. Everyone assumed we were going to do it with direct ascent. And what does that mean? Single spacecraft flies to the moon, lands on the moon, and then returns to the Earth. The advantage are it's the simplest way, and everyone pretty much assumed it was going to, it was going to go that way. The disadvantage is it would require a very large booster, even bigger than the Saturn V, called Nova. And I remember when I was a kid, 67, 68, I had a poster of all the, the NASA launch vehicles, and Nova was actually at the, the end of the poster, even though we, we never ended up building it. Landing a very large spacecraft on the moon is likely to be more difficult, and egress from a tall spacecraft uh, could be problematic. And this was one actually proposed by North American and you can see the resemblance. North American made the Apollo capsule, used, the, the capsule used on Apollo. And you know, here are the three astronauts. It does very much look like an Apollo uh, command module and service module. But then on top of this monster thing here, because the whole thing was going to land on the moon and then take off again and then go back to the Earth. So this is so, aside from the difficulty of these guys up here landing this thing on the moon, how are they going to get down? You know, one of the proposals for this actually had a built-in elevator rather than a ladder so they could get down. So this very difficult concept that was going to require a huge booster and had a host of other problems. Earth orbit rendezvous, uh, you would have this same large spacecraft, but you would put it together in space. It would be launched on two separate Saturn Vs, so you didn't require the big Nova. And then you would rendezvous in Earth orbit and put it together and then, and then do everything I just discussed. How do you do that? 
Advantage is it doesn't require the large Nova class booster. It requires rendezvous, but it's in Earth orbit. And that's significant, because say this goes up in two pieces. The astronaut goes up in this piece, then you have this other piece, they're gonna rendezvous in Earth orbit and put it together. If rendezvous fails, and at this point when they were planning this, rendezvous had never been done in space, not by us, not by the Soviets. If rendezvous fails, the astronauts are at least in this Earth return vehicle in Earth orbit, and they can come back and they live. When you say rendezvous, do you mean docking? Well, rendezvous is get next to each other, and then docking is to connect. So there's there's two aspects to that. Um, but that's correct. That's correct. Uh, so lunar orbit rendezvous, you have two smaller spacecraft that are launched on a single Saturn V. Doesn't require the large booster. The smaller spacecraft is easier to land on the moon as well as to egress and re-enter. It was just a short little ladder for Neil Armstrong to take his one small step. The disadvantages requires rendezvous in lunar orbit. So picture Apollo 11. You know, all uh, Armstrong and Aldrin are on the moon. They take off. If they can't rendezvous, they are now in lunar orbit in a spacecraft that is not capable of returning to the Earth. And even if it did, it's not capable of returning to the atmosphere, through the atmosphere. And it had never been demonstrated. It had never been demonstrated. And yet this was the decision that they made to implement Apollo within nine years. They said, this is the only way we're going to be able to pull it off. So one of the things Gemini was going to do, probably the most important thing that Gemini was going to do, is demonstrate that rendezvous was achievable and repeatable. This is the NASA Langley scientist, John Hubolt, who, uh, who proposed it. Uh, it was received with some derision initially. Werner von Braun wanted to go with just direct ascent, but eventually Hubolt prevailed. So it had never been done before, not by us, not by the Soviets. In August 1962, Vostok 3 and 4 passed within about, is it miles or kilometers? Five kilometers of each other in orbit, but they had no control over the orbit. It was essentially good shooting from the pad. They launched one, and then a while later, they launched the other one just so that they passed closely. And the Soviets said, woohoo, we beat the Americans again, we achieved rendezvous. But they had not. The spacecraft, they just went by each other. So once lunar orbit rendezvous was selected, it was absolutely critical to uh, lunar landing. It's not as straightforward as it sounds. Um, if you have two spacecraft that are in orbit and one is behind each other, so you think to yourself, how do I... I'm in this one, how do I catch up with this one? Well, I give it more gas, I fire my rocket engines. Well, actually, when you do that, as you accelerate, you go into a higher orbit and you, you fall further behind. So it's actually backwards of what you have to think to, to rendezvous. You have to slow down, fall into a lower orbit, and catch up and then ease your way up. And some of the astronauts who were initially trying to rendezvous experienced this problem. <coughs> Requires the ability to change orbit. Uh, Mercury and Vostok, all they could do, here's a Mercury capsule, all they could do was control roll, pitch, and yaw. They had roll, pitch, and yaw jets. So all they could do was roll, pitch, and yaw. They had no capability to actually translate, to actually move. They could just move the spacecraft around. So when John Glenn was orbiting the Earth, all he could do was change the attitude of his spacecraft. He had no capability to go faster or slower or up or down. And obviously, to rendezvous, you got to do that. Yeah, so it didn't have a good defensive docking. Uh, so Gemini needed those. So here's the Walter NASA didn't have a good defensive docking class, did they? There you go. There you go. So Gemini had the attitude control thrusters, but also the orbital control thrusters, and they they implemented that in something called the orbital attitude and maneuvering system, or OMS. And if you listen to some you know, Gemini transcripts, the controllers talking to the astronauts, you'll hear them make reference to OMS. So you know, here it's very obvious, the thrusters to move the spacecraft up and down and right and left. Mercury did not have those. Also, Mercury, the attitude control system was a hydrogen peroxide monopropellant, incidentally made by Bell Aircraft in Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. So when when John Glenn was maneuvering his spacecraft to look around, it was using a Bell attitude control system. The Gemini Ohms was using a bipropellant system with hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, which is about twice as efficient. So for every, for every pound 
of propellant and oxidizer on Gemini, you get twice as much oomph. But it also still needed extremely, couldn't just be more powerful, you still needed extremely fine control for docking, which Mercury did not require. Other Apollo requirements, long duration. The longest Mercury mission was Gordo Cooper on Faith 7. He was up for 34 hours. The moon in the back is going to take a week. So all the systems in the spacecraft need to be able to work for much, much longer. And they didn't know what that would do to an astronaut. You know, you know 34 hours compared to a week or more. How is that going to uh, affect his body? And I talked about this. You need power, fuel, and environmental consumables for the long duration mission. To do the power, Mercury relied on batteries, basically like our car battery. And even to achieve that 34 hours uh, in phase seven, Gordo Cooper actually had to power down different aspects of the spacecraft so the, uh, the batteries would last that long. On the moon mission, there was no way they could do it with batteries without an unreasonable amount of weight. So they went to fuel cells, hydrogen and oxygen, converted to electricity and water, which a lot of us have heard about because it's been proposed to power electric cars also as an alternative to batteries. But at the time, it was a new and proven technology, technology readiness level three. TRLs go from one to nine. Nine is good to go, so three is obviously very low. And the progress on them was much slower than hoped. In fact, the first two Gemini missions, the fuel cells weren't ready. So since they were short duration, they actually re-engineered them to use, uh, to use batteries had to do an EVA. No one had never, had ever gotten out of a spacecraft in a vacuum before. In the moon or in space, it had never been done. So you need a spacesuit that's going to operate in a vacuum. That wasn't a player uh, on, on Mercury. A means to maneuver if you're floating free. The astronaut has to learn to work in zero gravity, which, as we will get to, is a lot easier said than done. So let's compare the capsules. Here's the Mercury capsule with the one guy in it. Here's Gemini with the, with the two. That's, that's a training photo, so those aren't actual astronauts. So you can see it's a little bigger than Mercury, but not much bigger, not much bigger. There's not a lot of room in there for two guys for an extended duration mission. Meanwhile, back in, back in the US, <laughs> I'm not a Venus nice. man, or I would nice. try to do it in tune. <laughs> so this is uh, like the number two in the space program. And Karolev is basically Ver <coughs> von Braun. And the Soviet leadership is getting upset. They hear we're working on Gemini, and we, we can't let the Americans get ahead of us. They, we can't let them get ahead of us. So we have to take our one-man ships, and we have to convert them to have a flight of a three-person crew. And they say, we made this decision for two reasons. The Soyuz, which is their three-person spacecraft, is not going to be ready in time. And the Americans are preparing to launch Gemini, and they may overtake us in 1964. So you got to remember, this is the Cold War. This is the really big thing, us versus the Russians. So to beat us to having more than one person in space, they take their one-man capsule, and they modify it to hold three people. No room for spacesuits, no room for ejection seats. So if anything goes wrong, anything goes wrong, they're toast. Um, there's no escape until 45 seconds into the flight, because that's when the ejection seats would have saved you. So if something goes wrong, before 45 seconds, they're, they're dead. After that, they can deploy the parachutes early and float back to Earth. Retro rockets for landing, that's a, a technical aspect. The three people had to diet to fit in. <laughs> that's how tight it was. Wow. So on 12 October 1964, uh, they launched the three people on a 24-hour mission, and it is completely successful. Nothing goes wrong, uh, and they, they live, and they, they beat us so far as having more than one person into space. But the interesting thing about this mission, so on October 12th, they launch, and the, uh, Nikita Khrushchev is running the, uh, the Soviet Union, and the next day they land, and Lena Brezhnev is running the Soviet Union. <laughs> and it was not an election. You know? <laughs> it's not as if they launched on inauguration day. So just a nice little reminder of how as messed up as our system seems to be these days, it's still working relatively well to, to many other countries. Right. Boshka 2 was going to be a two-man mod of the one-man Vostok spacecraft. Still no escape until 45 seconds. This, they're going to try to do the first spacewalk with this one. Uh, the problem is 
uh, because it was a one-man capsule that was modified to hold two people, they could not carry enough extra air and oxygen to depressurize, let that all out, and then repressurize again. There wasn't enough room for tanks to do that. So they said, we're gonna do it with an airlock. They make this jury-rigged, it was actually an inflatable airlock that was gonna enable the one astronaut to go out and do his spacewalk and then get back in without depressurizing the spacecraft. They also use tubes at this point compared to solid state transistors and their Vostok spacecraft, if you depressurized it and it was operating in a vacuum, the tubes powering the electronics would overheat because there was no air to give them convective cooling. So there were really two reasons why they couldn't do that. So they launched on March 18, 1965, the first uh, extravehicular activity in history, 12 minutes long. Here it is on the Times. Russian floats in space for 10 minutes. Uh, and there's a picture of him with his, with his lifeline. But then the problem started. This was not uh, trouble-free like the previous flight. The spacesuit wasn't working very well. The joints started to sweat. He was having trouble getting back in with the airlock. He had a three-degree rise in his body temperature, and he said that the sweat in his spacesuit was almost up to his knees, cooling, cooling in the bottom of the spacesuit. He was actually issued a suicide pill in case he was marooned outside the spacecraft and could not get back in. Fortunately, he did not have to use it. So he finally gets in. Yes, sir. Why is EVA so important for the, e uh, for the Gemini program? Uh, well, Gemini was not going to land on the moon. They, it wasn't even going to go to the moon. Uh, but you had to prove that you could depressurize the spacecraft and operate in a vacuum. So even though the astronauts were not going to be walking around on the moon, they were going to do everything but that. Because on Apollo, the lunar module lands on the moon, you have to depressurize the lunar module and get out and walk around and do work in your spacesuit. We have oh, to, okay. you have, does that, does that, All so right, even though I, they're not walking. I was trying to figure out why they would have to fix the it, Gemini it, mission. It's, <laughs> a, it's a very good question. So they're doing everything that would be required to walk on the moon, okay. except walking on the moon. Okay. But it's a very good question. It's not, not intuitively obvious. Okay, so they jettison the airlock and the, the Voshkot is now starting to roll. The hatch had a slow leak, the cabin pressure is failing, the automatic re-entry failed, so they had to do it manually. Not really enough room in the spacecraft to do this. I don't know if I have it on my slide. No, I don't have it on my slide. So the commander who's doing the manual re-entry, there wasn't enough room for him to stay in his seat and you know look at the star and, and control this and do that. So he had to get out of his seat, and the astronaut who was just doing the spacewalk had to get underneath the seats and hold the other astronaut in place so he could line everything up to do the re-entry. Then when he had it all lined up, they both had to get back in their seats and buckle up and press the button to fire the retro rockets. And that took time. So they ended up overshooting their landing area by 240 miles. So I was curious. I looked up where they came down in Siberia, because they didn't, Soviets didn't land in the ocean, they landed in Siberia, and they had a crew ready to pick them up. So if you go to Google Maps and you type in the lat long of where they came down, this is what you see. You can do it right now on your phone or on your computer. This is what you'll see. So, okay, fine. Google Maps is very detailed, let's zoom out. Okay, you zoom out, that's what you see. You zoom out more, that's what you see. You zoom out five more times, and this is where they are, and then these are these little, you know, one cow towns. So they spent two days in the wilderness before they were covered. They were in four feet of snow, no one could get to them. So that very first night, a helicopter made it over them and dropped some sleeping bags and some supplies, but it was two more days before, uh, before they were actually extracted. So fortunately they lived, but it was a very complicated mission with a lot of mishaps. So, let's finally talk about Gemini. Gemini Titan III, the first two ones were unmanned uh, with Gus Grissom and John Young. Spacecraft was named Molly Brown. Anyone know why it was named Molly Brown? Anybody? It's unsinkable. It's unsinkable, because you know, Gus Grissom, as you would have seen in the right stuff, his Mercury spacecraft sank into the Atlantic. So launches on March 23rd, 1965. T-minus 10, nine, eight, seven, Six, five, four, three, two, one. 
Do you know offhand uh, what keeps the rocket going straight up like that? I know if occasionally they have problems with that. The rocket is so I get off this, that are, way, are you like lobbing me a softball? My phone is ringing. Uh, it's my 82 year old aunt. I hope she's okay. Um, that's a great question. That's a terrific question. And it was one that when I was a kid, puzzled me. Even eight, nine, ten years old, I was already thinking like an engineer. And I thought, and I really only knew the Saturn V because I was too young for this stuff. You know, the Saturn V had little fins on the bottom, little fins. And as it's going up, I'm like, what's keeping it going straight? There's not enough air over those fins when it's going real slow to be doing anything. So why isn't it falling over? You know, picture yourself, picture the Saturn V being a yardstick and your finger is, are the rocket engines, and you're lifting it up. How can you move your finger so precisely to keep it from, from no perceptible motion at all? And the way that's done, there are extremely powerful and precise hydraulic actuators on the engines that are moving the engines very subtle amounts, dozens of times per second, to keep the thing from moving. Hmm. And those, and this came up before the meeting, those, uh, to someone anyway, uh, those actuators were actually made by Mo. Yes, it was you in uh, in East Aurora. Uh, those actuators on Mercury, Gemini, Saturn, the space shuttle, and the space launch system, Artemis coming up. Those actuators on the rocket engines are all made by Mo right in East Aurora. Gemini was 109. Feet. There you go. Thank you very much. That Vostok two. Did the Russians actually willingly admit all of those shortcomings? Not at the time. Okay. Oh my God, not at the time. But since then, probably uh, a lot of this stuff we actually didn't learn until the wall came down and the Soviet Union uh, dissolved. Um, there's a professor at Columbia, I forget his name, who's actually spoken to our local group of AIAA. And he's probably the foremost expert in the West on the Soviet space program. And he admitted that most of what he knows was during this window where it opened up and we had lots of cooperation between the two countries and that's pretty much closed again since Putin's um, gone nuts. I worked with a Russian, former Russian engineer back in the 80s, 90s, and I, oh, 70s actually, and this guy claimed that he was on the second team of Sputnik. And they first tried to launch Sputnik and it failed and the whole team was shot. And his <laughs> team took over. Oh, God. The whole team was shot. shot. Oops. We're executed for failure. And then he took over, and they were very careful to be successful. <laughs> good incentive. Yeah, the, I found the that Russians were the very good at, 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 at fooling yeah. people. Yeah, that was, that uh, they they lost with, with the, uh, They only had a few working submarines. They had a battery uh, system that produced chlor chlorine gas, so they'd have to vent out. Uh, every six days in one of our missions when I was in the Navy um, was to get, photograph them when they came up. And I nearly got killed because one day I was working the, the Hasselblad uh, motor camera that we had and... Uh, Chlorine gas. And, yeah, and they, uh, they were trying to uh, shoot me. And so, uh, uh, yeah. So what they did is they would take their their uh, their submarines. They only had a few working ones, and all they do, all they did was change the screws. 
that it's the propellers. And so we, they got a different sound. Um, and with, uh, there are certain uh, monitoring stations all up and down the, the Atlantic where uh, we could tell, and we still can tell, uh, what kind of a submarine is going through that part of the Atlantic. And uh, I'm not going to say anything more because that gets a little too close to it. At some point, it gets very classified very yeah. quickly. Yeah, it gets a little classified. I'm not going to say anything more. Uh, okay, so back to Gemini 3. Uh, three orbits, four hours and 52 minutes. It was a test run for the system and the crew. And they are, were actually careful to not launch into too high an orbit because they're testing this orbital maneuvering system for the first time. And if it failed, they didn't want the astronauts to be stranded. So they launched them low enough that the, uh, the atmospheric drag would bring them back down to recovery while they still had enough consumables to, uh, to live. Uh, they changed orbit for the first time in history. Oh, okay, I got it slightly wrong. The last burn was to lower the orbit in case the retro rockets fail. Why Molly Brown, we discussed that. Okay, Gemini 4, it's first, first spacewalk. Uh, Jim McDivitt and Ed White. Uh, 3 to 7 June, 1965, the goal is the first US spacewalk because the Russians albeit with some complications, have already done it. And on the third orbit, Jim McDivitt depressurizes the spacecraft. Again, we don't, we don't have an airlock. Uh, the hatch was initially stuck, but eventually it opened, and I have a very nice short little video talking about this. After we got the hatch open, uh, Ed Jim stood McDivitt. up in the seat and got ready to go, and, and um, we cleared him to go, and then he took the and pushed off from the seat. Take my key around. I think I'm drowning a little bit, so I don't want to fire the gun gun. Okay, I'm ready from the spacecraft. Ed White is flying at 17,000 miles per hour, 200 miles above the Earth. Okay, I'm on. If the spacesuit fails, the difference in pressure will kill him instantly. If the lifeline fails, he'll literally be lost in space. As White floats in space, a glove drifts out of the capsule. I don't even know whose glove it was. I don't know whether it was his or mine. Ed White floats in space for 36 minutes, but has to be inside the capsule before day turns to night. We told him to get back in the spacecraft, and he sort of didn't hear us. He didn't really want to recognize, uh, okay, that it's the EVA's over, time to get back in the spacecraft. He was very reluctant to get back in. He was having a good time out there. I would have been reluctant to get back in, too. The flight director said, get back in. Okay. <laughs> and that was, that was Gene Krantz, was the, the flight director at the time. So there's uh, Ed White, first American in space. There's another picture. And look how beautiful it is underneath him. I, I just can't imagine. Can't imagine it. And uh, he just he didn't want to come back in. <laughs> And then uh, about a year and a half later, 18 months later, we had the, uh, the Apollo 1 fire, the yeah. three Apollo astronauts die in fire. Gus Grissom, yeah. first, um, second American in space, first American to fly, first person to fly in space twice. First person to fly in space twice. Ed White, uh, first American to walk in space and ride to Chaffee, uh, were asphyxiated and burned to death. Yeah. Uh, here's a picture of them. Uh, Grissom. White and Chaffee. Incidentally, uh, Gus Grissom, had he lived, almost certainly would have been the first American to walk on the moon. Uh, Deke Slayton was the, the person who made those assignments. He, he ran the astronaut office, and before uh, he passed away, he said it was, it was going to be Gus. How, how tall were they? Uh, none of them were very tall. Yeah. Uh, the I saw the space, the space suit for Gus Grissom, and he's super small. Yeah, 
you know, Grissom, I, I'm not sure, but Mercury, there was a, a very restrictive height requirement. All the astronauts were short. They relaxed it a little bit more on Gemini and a little bit more on Apollo. But of course, these are all Gemini astronauts. So, you know, Ed White uh, was supposed to be a big fit guy. He might have been the biggest one, perhaps 5'10", but I'm, but I'm guessing. Was there a master plan for each of the launches and what they hope to accomplish on each of them? Did they lay that out ahead of time and say by seven we want to, you know? In general, yes. It was, it was tweaked as necessary when, when things went wrong, but in general, yes, there was a plan for what they wanted to accomplish on each one. And we'll actually talk about that a little bit because they had to tweak their plans somewhat over the course of Gemini. Uh, this is Betty Grissom. Uh, Every year, uh, Pad 34, uh, where the fire took place, is maintained as a memorial. They never did a launch from that afterwards. And every year on that date, uh, they, uh, they have a ceremony. And this was 2017. This was the 50th anniversary, and I believe it was the last time Betty, Betty Grissom attended. Uh, for those of us who can't go, and if you heard my Apollo talk, you, you heard me show this before, you know, here's the Youngman, here's Niagara Falls Boulevard, here's uh, Ellicott Creek Park, and of course our, our Temple Cemetery is up there somewhere. Uh, there are three streets, Gus Grissom, mm -hmm. Ed White, and Roger Chaffee Drive. And ever since, every year except one, I, I've forgotten it got by me, but every year except one since I've been giving this talk, on that anniversary, my wife and I drive over there and yeah. we, just, we just think about the, uh, the astronauts for a few minutes. Sadly, uh, it's double sadly for two reasons, Something extremely similar happened to the Soviets before. Um, this is Valentin Bondarenko, and here he is with his wife and son. A couple of years before the Apollo 1 fire, he was in a test facility on the ground in a very similar atmosphere, uh, pure oxygen at atmospheric pressure at 4.7 psi which is basically what caused the Apollo 1 fire. Didn't light it, but that's what made it a conflagration. He's in a, uh, a long-term test on the ground in this test facility, and he was making some tea on a hot plate, and he was cleaning uh, some, an oxygen mask or something with an alcohol swabbed pad, and he put it down too close to the hot plate, and the little alcohol swab flashed into flame turned his whole wool, he was wearing a wool suit, body suit, in the thing, immediately caught it on fire. And uh, it was on the ground, they opened it up real fast, they got him out in a minute or two, but he died of his burns uh, a couple of days later. Good. As they were taking him out, he kept repeating, it was my fault, it was my fault, I'm sorry. The question is, you know, when did we learn this stuff about the Soviet space program? We didn't learn about this until around 1980. Uh, it was totally under wraps. They airbrushed him out of any photos that were released of their astronaut candidates. So if the Soviets had come clean on the dangers of a high pressure oxygen atmosphere, the Apollo 1 fire would never have happened. Gemini 5, uh, Gordo Cooper and Pete Conrad. You can always recognize Pete Conrad by the gap in his teeth. Uh, eight day flight the 21st to the 29th of August, verified astronaut health for being up in space for that long. It was also the first use of the fuel cells, which worked, but they had issues. The water that the fuel cells pr produced was supposed to be usable for drinking, and it, uh, it wasn't. There was you know, chemicals in it. They performed multiple phantom rendezvous. They didn't have anything to rendezvous with, but they practiced rendezvous. Uh, before an Ohm's thruster triad failed, and then they came back down, and they surpassed the Vostok 5 record in space of four, uh, four days and 23 hours. So now we are ahead of the Soviets with respect to time and orbit. Gemini 6, Wally Shara and uh, Tom Stafford. This is to be the first rendezvous and docking in space with the GATV, or the Gemini Agena target vehicle, which was basically a space drone the GATV was a space drone manufactured by Lockheed in Sunnyvale, California, powered by a Bell Agena rocket engine made right at Niagara Falls. So, you know, Buffalo keeps entering this picture. So October 25th, the Agena launches first, and the Gemini is to follow once the Agena is safely in orbit. Uh, 
but a couple of minutes after launch, the telemetry stops and the radar that's tracking it, instead of seeing one healthy Agena booster, it sees a bunch of them. And what happened was the Bell Agena engine, uh, when it went to light, it exploded. And that's the only, the Bell Agena engine was one of the most reliable rocket engines of the early space era. It operated successfully about 350 times. And this is the only documented failure attributed to, uh, to that engine. And it was for a technical reason. I don't know, I, maybe I go into it a little bit. So they don't launch Gemini 6. A symposium of 19 rocket experts from around the nation are convened to investigate the Agena failure. Uh, I say that because one of them was Craig Schmidt, Bell rocket engineer Craig Schmidt, who taught uh, my vehicle configuration and design class at UB in 1979. Mm -hmm. It was my favorite uh, course of my whole undergraduate uh, career. Uh, terrific uh, guy. Oh, here we go, included Craig M. Schmidt from Bell Aerosystems. Uh, so Gemini 6 has not launched, because they got nothing to rendezvous with. So Gem Gemini 6 is on the ground, it didn't go up. Gemini 7, Jim Lovell, and uh, Frank Mormon. Frank Mormon had to think for a second. Long endurance mission planned for 14 days. 14 days, so this is the inside of the Gemini spacecraft. And there ain't nowhere else to go. Mm. I mean, you can, you can get out of the seat and there's a little bit of room in front of you, but that's it. It's not like there's a room back there to change your clothes or stretch out or anything like that. That's it. 14 days. At this point, NASA engineers have an idea. You know, we lost our GATV on Gemini 6, so let's use Gemini 7 as a target for Gemini 6. Let's have Gemini 6 rendezvous with Gemini 7. Chris Kraft, who's the, the head of, of this sort of thing at this time, they propose it to him, and he says, you're out of your minds. Uh, they've never controlled two-man spacecraft in space before. They, they don't really have a means of doing it, but the engineers pushed and pushed. They said, look, we can control one with the old Mercury system, and we can control the other with the new Gemini system, and I think we can do it, and we can keep forging ahead. We can keep forging ahead. Problems are, you know, you have to track the two-man spacecraft at once, and you have to, they only have one launch pad. So after Gemini 7 goes up, you have to prep the launch pad in two weeks instead of two, three, or four months to, uh, to launch another one. But the plan was approved. They briefed it to President Johnson, and, and he gave it the thumbs up on October 28th, three days after Gemini 6 Agena failed. So now Gemini 6 is renamed Gemini 6A and Gemini 7. So on December 4th, Gemini 7 launches as planned. Uh, December 12th, Gemini 6A, they're on their countdown to launch for rendezvous. The engines fire, and they shut down one and a half seconds later. So Wallace Schirra and Tom Stafford are now sitting on 150 tons of hypergolic propellant and oxidizer. Hypergolic means that when they come in contact with each other, they immediately burn and explode. So if the engine shut down, say, because there's like cracked fuel lines and this stuff is mixing, they're about to blow up. Uh, the book says if this happens, you eject. Shiraz, like, I think everything's okay. I didn't feel the rocket move. He chose not to. And that really, I don't want to say it saved the Gemini program because it would have proceeded. But if, if they ejected on the pad, it would have totally ruined their capsule and it would have taken months and months and months to build another one. So they sat tight after determining that nothing was going to explode. 40 minutes later, the technicians come out and <coughs> remove them from the spacecraft. Because if it's going to blow up, you know, why risk more than just the two people? And the problem was simply traced to a loose plug. The third launch attempt for Gemini 6A on December 15th was successful. And uh, now I have a little video talking about that rendezvous with Gemini 6 and Gemini 7. From a lower orbit, Gemini 6 is catching up to Gemini 7. How are the Cerro boys doing? Did they go over a while ago? They sure did. They're about five minutes ahead of you. Roger. But when Gemini 6 came up the rendezvous, we saw them coming up from below. Hey, I think I'm done. Is that spacecraft center? There's nothing more the ground crew can do. The pilots are now in complete control. The two capsules are attempting to fly in formation just inches apart. <laughs> 
no two spacecraft have ever been this close. Ask them what their range is now. They just came up and, and, and stopped, and, and there we were together. You know, nose to nose, side to side. It was a, a really fine sight. We could see through the windows. We could see Tom and Wally quite well. The two pilots fly their capsules in tight formation for 270 minutes, three orbits of the Earth. The control system on Gemini was so good that you could fly within six inches of one another without bothering anything. Rendezvous demonstrates how far the space program has come in just four years. Wow. And if, if you look carefully, you can see the astronauts waving from the windows. That's how, that's how close they are. Did they do that by uh, line of sight or yes. with their instrumentation on board? No, they had radar to execute the rendezvous, but the formation flying was purely, purely eyeballs. And uh, let me tell you, I, I've done it in, in the T-38 jet trainer at about 500 miles an hour, three feet away. So these guys are going 17,000 miles an hour, and Borman's talking about inches, inching up six inches from the other capsule. It's just, and this, that little video almost brings it does bring tears to my eyes sometimes. It's just incredible. So two Geminis fly six to ten feet apart in man's first 1973. So I want to stress again, 14 days like this, and they were doing, you know, bodily functions in zero gravity and trying to put all that stuff away and not have it leak around the cabin and sweat in 14 days. So not surpassed until Skylab 2. Okay, well, this is Gemini. That's Skylab 2. <laughs> so, uh, incredible, incredible. So they kept the spacesuits on the whole. Journey. They actually, uh, they had a uh, light weights. That's that's a great question, because when the spacecraft were depressurized for an EVA, they had spacesuits that were designed to operate in a vacuum for an extended period of time. The spacesuits that they wore on Gemini 7 would protect them in a vacuum, but it was really only for emergency purposes. They were a much lighter weight spacesuit. And for most of the flight, they actually were able to wiggle out of them and were just wearing you know, some sort of normal flight suit. So they were actually in clothing of, of one sort or another for most of them. They were pressure, pressure suits. I'm sorry? They were pressure suits. The, the Gemini 7 one. Mm -hmm. More of a pressure suit like you have in an SR-71 or a U-2. Yeah, I worked on those. So. At uh, Carleton. At Carleton? Sure. Uh, yeah. David Clark. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, in the SR-71 suit. I believe you can use me. Yep, yep. Walter? Yes? What, what type of mental health testing did they have to do prior to these men being put in such defining <laughs> conditions? <laughs> I'm not an expert on that. There were books written about it. But it was uh, very, very stressful. I mean, you can see, if you watch the movie, The Right Stuff, you can see some of the wacky stuff they, they were doing to them. Uh, really, for the, the first couple of astronaut classes, they really went above and beyond to make sure the guys wouldn't go nuts under. Yeah. I, I couldn't do it, oh my god. And I applied to be an astronaut. I wasn't remotely selected, but 14 days in that, I, I wouldn't even get in. I wouldn't even get in. You're too tall anyways. Well, but I, this was space shuttle days. This was space shuttle days. Did they sleep? I mean, could they, they, they did. exercise at all? Yeah. Really, for exercise, all they could really do were you know, isometrics, yeah. to, to my train of thought. Uh, but they definitely took turns sleeping, for sure. They, they Sleep-deprived, you wouldn't, for that length of time, even if it was possible, you wouldn't be able to react to any kind of emergency. Right. The one advantage is that it was weightlessness, so it didn't, you know, so, so they had less effect on their body in terms of stresses and sitting still like that and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember a, a fellow Air Force officer came up to me once. He wanted me to review a paper he was writing in 
don't need to go into the details, but one of the things he talked to was that if you're without sleep, like for three days straight, it's equivalent to some ridiculous blood alcohol level, so far as your ability to, to function and do stuff. So they, yeah, sometimes sleep was tough, but they had to do it. Okay. Uh, so also you could, you would hallucinate too, which was bad too, if you could get. That would be bad. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Gemini 8, uh, Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott, uh, they, the, the Agena has been fixed now. Agena is recertified for flight after the Gemini 6 incident. And incidentally, just to wave the bell in the Western New York flight a little bit, the thing that caused the Agena engine to explode uh, on Gemini 6 was a change into the order of the fuel and the oxidizer flowing into the combustion chamber that was requested by NASA. Bell engineers didn't want to do it. And that's why it blew up. Mm -hmm. And after they fixed it, they changed it back. So, Agena recertified for flight after Gemini 6. Agena target launches at 10 a.m. Uh, this is the, the Atlas booster. This is, this is the Agena. The Bell engine is, is in here. Gemini 8 follows at 10.41 a.m. Gemini Type 2, which we've seen before. Uh, they rendezvous with the Agena at 4.39 p.m. Now, rendezvous has already been demonstrated, of course, by Gemini 6 and 7. And they dock at 5.14 p.m. Someone pointed out docking versus rendezvous, first ever in space. And these are pictures that Dave Scott took of the uh, Gemini Agena target vehicle as they're getting closer to it. Neil Armstrong is flying. Let's, let's stick at this one for a minute. So this is uh, the docking collar that they're going to plug into. This is the main Agena spacecraft made by Lockheed in California. And this is the Bell Agena engine right here. This is the nozzle extension at the back. 16,000 pounds of thrust. And here's Neil Armstrong right before he's going to plug in. And uh, he got his first docking in space. But 27 minutes later, the combined vehicles begin to yaw and tumble. And if you mm. saw the, the Neil Armstrong biography movie three or four or five years ago, First Man, this scene is actually portrayed in First Man. So they think it's Agena, blame it on the Agena, blame it on the Agena. So they turn off the attitude control system on Agena and it gets worse. It turns out Agena was fighting to, to keep them from spinning, but it was being overpowered, it gets worse. So then uh, Armstrong undocks from the Agena. It gets worse yet again. He turns off the ohms, the orbital and attitude maneuvering system. The acceleration stops, but they're still spinning around really, really fast. Uh, so Armstrong enables the recovery maneuvering system. This was a secondary maneuvering system used specifically for deorbit and recovery. And he uses that to, to stabilize the spacecraft. But the rules are, once you've activated that system that's used to come down, you need to come down. It's not designed to sit in space for a couple of days once it's been fired the first time. So they have to perform an immediate re-entry, which they do within an orbit or two. And it turns out it was caused by a stuck 25 pound thruster on the, uh, on the homes. So did they, uh, land, did they land fire from their projector? Uh, they didn't land where they were originally intended to. It was They landed in one of the backup sites where there were a couple of ships around. Uh, and this is uh, one of these guys, like maybe that one right there. I think they even have a little fake flame here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so one of those was stuck on, and that is what was causing the thing to spin. So when they shut down that entire system, um, it's making it spin. When they shut down that entire system, the acceleration stopped. Uh, and then to stop the spinning, they had to use this recovery system. But once that's activated, they had to come down, which they did. And there they are, uh, Armstrong and Scott, successful recovery with the, uh, with the scuba divers. Mm -hmm. Gemini 9, uh, Elliot C, and Charles Bassett, uh, are scheduled to do that one, but uh, some number of months before they launched, they were flying out to the McDonald building in St. Louis in a T-38 to inspect their uh, their space capsule, and they, uh, while maneuvering to land, they hit the hangar. They were actually killed uh, like a hundred feet from the space capsule that they were that they were coming out to inspect. Um, 
It was actually a two ship of T-38s. They were, they were going out in formation. C was flying the first one, and Tom Stafford, who was his backup crew, was flying the second one, so they're flying out in formation. And uh, when they broke out of the clouds, they were not in a position to land. Like, mm. like they're here, and, and maybe the runway is that desk. There was no way they could get over to land in time. So C elected to stay below the clouds, below the clouds, and maneuver around to land. And while he was doing so, he, he flew into the hangar. Uh, Stafford immediately said, I'm not going to circle. The maneuver is called a circle. He went back up into the clouds and was, was going around for a whole new fresh approach. So, uh, so uh, Bassett and C are killed, and Stafford and Gene Cernan, who were in the backup T-38 on their backup crew, they end up flying Gemini 9. Plan launch for May 17, 1966. Uh, the Agena launches first on the Atlas, and the second stage fails. Not of the Agena, but the Atlas. So they have now lost an, the Agena vehicle that they were going to talk with. Replacement Agena is not available in time, so someone proposes using this, this backup thing, the augmented target docking adapter, as a substitute for the, uh, for the Agena. Basically, it does the same thing, but it's unpowered. The Agena, because of that 16,000 pound bell engine can maneuver, the, uh, the ADTA cannot. So both launch on June 3rd, 1966. Gemini 9 rendezvous to dock with the ADTA, and this is what they see. Uh, this is the ADTA. The docking collar is, is right in here. This is the nose cone of the vehicle, which is supposed to separate and be gone, and it's not. So obviously they can't they can't dock because the docking collar is, is covered up by the uh, the nose cone. And you may have heard the phrase. Uh, Tom Stafford actually said it. It looks like we're dealing with an angry alligator up here. <laughs> That's what it looked like. Stafford actually wanted to because he knew that Gemini could maneuver so precisely from Gemini six and seven. He asked permission to go in there and try and knock it off through the nose of the capsule, and uh, it was turned down. They said that that's too risky. Uh, however, they did practice multi, multiple rendezvous and station keeping, just flying in formation with it. Uh, Cernan had an EVA on day three that had multiple issues. Stafford, he was so tired, Stafford was worried he might not be able to get back into the capsule, uh, but he did, and they had a perfect recovery, 700 meters from where they were aiming. Wow. Why did the U.S. always land in water? Just be safer? Uh, it was just a decision, you know, the water cushions the landing, uh, and, you know, we had the Pacific available. I, I'm going to wave my hands. There are, there are good answers for why we did what we did and the Soviets did what they did, but I don't want to make something up. I don't, I don't remember precisely, but it was definitely what we did. Interestingly, for Gemini, so Mercury is, is splashing down in the Atlantic, for Gemini, the initial proposal, does anyone remember the Regalo hang gliders? Uh, it, well, you know what, hang gliders, you know, out in California, they jump off a cliff with a glider attached to their back. Well, the Regalo was a specific type of hang glider. And the initial proposal for Gemini was to be that instead of a parachute, it would deploy a giant Regalo hang glider, and the capsule would just sit underneath it, and the pilots would fly it to a landing in the desert in the US. But they had too many problems with that, so they went back to the tried and true splashdown method of, uh, of Mercury. So that's basically what the shuttle did later. Uh, basically, except the whole thing yeah, was a right. glider. In fact, if you go to, it's not the Air Force Museum, the Ugger Hazy branch of the uh, Air and Space Museum in DC, next to Dulles Airport, mm -hmm. they have a little practice vehicle that the Gemini astronauts use to fly the Regalo. See there, it's the Regalo glider with a little uh, subscale Gemini capsule underneath. You can, you can see it there. So we're noticing a theme: Gemini four, the alligator, and an exhausting EVA. Exhausting EVA. The, the EVAs, even though they're executing them safely, the astronauts are not able to do all their stuff, their tasks to do outside the spacecraft because it is so exhausting, which is kind of counterintuitive to accomplish things in, uh, in zero gravity. But they kept going. They kept going. That was the, the spirit of the country at the time, and the engineers, and the managers, and the politicians. They kept going. So Gemini 10, John Young, 
uh, and Michael Collins. Don't have time to explain it here today, but uh, John Young, in my opinion, greatest astronaut who ever was or ever will be for a variety of reasons, more so than, than Neil Armstrong. Uh, I actually met John Young once at a conference I was at for CalSpan. Had no idea who he was. This was before I was interested in Gemini. I'm in the booth handing out hot sauce because I'm in marketing at the time. <laughs> a guy comes up to me, an old man in a turtleneck. He says, hi, I'm John Young. And I'm like, hi, you want a bottle of hot sauce? <laughs> I would give a piece of my anatomy to spend time with John Young. And I had no idea who he was. I had no idea who he was. It, it, it's still, but you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So Gemini 10 launches on July 18, 1966, flawless rendezvous and docking with the, uh, with the Gemini Agena target vehicle. They fire the big engine, they fire that Bell engine, 16,000 pounds of thrust, and it boosts the joint vehicles into a much higher orbit, uh, 512 nautical mile maximum distance from the Earth. Subsequently, they disconnect, they change their orbit, and they rendezvous with the GAT V8. That's the one that Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott uh, pulled away from. Collins does an EVA, he goes over to the GAT V8, he retrieves a dust collector. This was part of the plan. You say, you know, they're <coughs> trying to do stuff on as the missions evolve. And again, he has some difficulty re-entering the spacecraft. And he talks about this at length in Carrying the Fire, the book I mentioned initially. Um, Gemini 11, uh, Pete Comrade, and my cousin Dick Gordon, I wish he was, he's not. <laughs> um, 12 to 15 September 1966, planned a Gina docking and Gordon uh, EVA. So they do a single orbit docking with the Agena. The other missions, you know, it took multiple orbits to maneuver and get close and dock with the Agena. This one, and I, I can't really explain it in more detail, I am totally ignorant of orbital mechanics. But in one orbit, apparently that's much, much harder. They, uh, they rendezvoused and docked with the Agena. This time they fire that Agena engine, made by Bell, Niagara Falls, and it boosts the combined vehicles to 741 nautical miles apogee. So what is this, 50-something uh, years later? 50-something years later, that's still a record. That's still a record. Man has been further from the Earth because they've gone to the moon but man has never been in a higher Earth orbit than 741 nautical miles. And they got there on a Bell engine built in Niagara Falls in 1966. Wow. Uh, Gordon attaches a tether to the Agena uh, during the EVA, and uh, so Dick Gordon gets out, attaches this thing to the Agena, the Gemini capsule is here, and um, they maneuver the Gemini to try and get them slowly to swing around. They're trying to demonstrate uh, artificial gravity with centrifugal force, and they do. They generate a, a teensy weensy bit. They do five dockings and undockings, and then uh, Pete Conrad, as they're pulling away, he said, we made the three feet per second retrograde burn from Agena and left the best friend we ever had. They just loved that Gemini Agena target vehicle and the extra propulsion it gave them. They could also use it for attitude control. When they were docked with the Agena, they didn't have to use up their attitude control fuel. The Agena did all the work. So it's a tremendous vehicle. I give a whole talk on Agena, uh, although you're hearing about a third of it today. Uh, Gemini 12, Jim Lovell and Buzz Aldrin. This is, the last, this is the last mission. This is the last Gemini mission. So every EVA, except Ed White's, where he really didn't do anything, has had problems. Uh, every other EVA has, has had issues. Aldrin is a very experienced scuba diver, and he does extensive underwater training in pools where he you know, has just enough weight and floats to be neutrally buoyant. And he really says, what do we need to do to do this right? And he says, we need to add a lot of extra handholds to the spacecraft and footholds. Because if you think about it, zero gravity, say, uh, you know, you want to put a wrench on a bolt and turn it, and your feet aren't attached to anything, so you try and turn the bolt, and all of a sudden your whole body is swinging like this. That was part of the problem. So Aldrin figures this stuff out and modifies the procedures and modifies the spacecraft. Gemini 12 and their Agena launch on November 11th. They rendezvous with the GAT V. Aldrin does three EVAs totaling over five hours, no difficulty whatsoever. 
you know, and uh, Buzz Aldrin is, is remembered today, of course, as the second uh, person to walk on the moon. But before that, what we really need to remember him by is he broke the code on EVA. He broke the code on EVA. And this is a picture of Buzz Aldrin holding onto the Agena outside the Gemini spacecraft. Here's another one. So Buzz Aldrin perfects extravehicular activity. The last Gemini mission recovered on November 15, 1966. So Gemini achievements, frequency of launches unmatched, you know, the rapidity that they launch one after another, numerous firsts, difficulties encountered and overcome, total program, five years, where they say, we're gonna have a Gemini program and nothing exists yet, and five years later it's done and it's successful with all those launches. What about the Soviets? They were ahead of us before Gemini, they were behind after, and they never caught up to this day. Recommended reading, Carrying the Fire, I, I can't recommend it enough. It's just a terrific book. Uh, James Grimwood was a NASA historian. He throw, wrote three uh, relatively long technical summaries of Mercury. This is Gemini on the shoulders of Titans, because that was their booster. This new ocean was Mercury and chariots for Apollo. You can download these for free, the PDF. I don't suggest you read the whole thing, they're, they're pretty long, but if you want to look up a specific detail, again, download them for free, tremendous, tremendous resources. Uh, and then I mentioned, I couldn't remember his name, the prof in New York City who's an expert on the Soviet space program, uh, Asif Siddiqui wrote a book, Challenge for Apollo, the Soviet Union and the Space Race. Uh, that's a terrific book, and I, I mentioned Siddiqui spoke to the Niagara Frontier section of AIAA via Zoom, and we recorded it, and we still have the recording. That was a fantastic talk. And if any of you would like to watch that recording, it's a little over an hour, I'd be happy to, to send you the link. Or if you ask Dan, I can send him the link, he could get it to you. Last words, uh, when I was a kid, all I knew was Saturn and Apollo, and I thought, I thought that's what the spacecraft was supposed to look like. You know, the Saturn V with the tapered stages and the command module. But giving this talk, I've just kind of fallen in love with Gemini. I just think today the, the Gemini spacecraft and the Titan booster, it doesn't make any sense because it's such a simple thing, but I, I just think it's aesthetically a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, last words. Oops. Ah, I got ahead of myself. You guys will, will be able to relate to this a little bit. So after I became obsessed with Gemini, I tried to get a Gemini astronaut, and there were very few left, to speak to us here in Buffalo. And I made, uh, I wrote letters, I tried to make phone calls, which was very difficult, and I was not successful. But one of the letters was to Frank Borman. I, I found his address, it was in the phone book, and I sent him uh, a letter, and I never heard back. I never heard back, okay, fine, I'm Frank Borman, why should he write back to me? So I'm, not, I'm in Vivler's in East Aurora with my wife. <laughs> and my phone rings, and it's like East Yahunga, Montana. And I, I leave a voicemail, I put it away. And I'm walking around Vivler's, Montana, Montana. That's where Borman lives. So I look at my phone, there's no voicemail. So I call back, and I hear this, hello? And I said, yes, hi, this is Walter Gordon. I just had a missed call from this phone number. Oh, hi, Walter, this is Frank Borman. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he says, I'd really love to come to speak to you guys, but my wife, Susan, has advanced Alzheimer's, and I'm her main caregiver, and I really can't get away. And he's about 90 years old at this point, wow. 88. Wow. Uh, he, incidentally, is the oldest living U.S. astronaut right now. Um, and I say, I understand, and now I don't want to hang up, because I've got Frank Borman on the phone. He wants to go, and I want to talk. <laughs> um, so I said, you know, it was really incredible what you did, you know, on Gemini 7, blah, blah. I don't even remember what I said, but I, I brought up Gemini 7. And then he said to me, she was a good ship. She was a good ship. So we'll, we'll end the talk with Frank Borman. Thank you. <laughs> Walter, you topped Chevettis. Uh, <laughs> with, with a lack of computing power, how do they do all those orbital maneuvers, all slide rules, and 
No, uh, no, I mean, you had computers at that point to do stuff on the ground. You had, you had computers in the 60s, and there were computers in the spacecraft. But again, you know, you, you get sick of hearing, you know, more computer power in my iPhone than in the Gemini computer, but it's true. They were, they were minute. I mean, my, my watch, which is 30 years old, is, shows I'm a geek. My calculator watch probably has as much computing power as the Gemini mission computer. But they had them. They just, they had to code very, very, very efficiently. And they also, there was a lot of data entry because they didn't have enough memory to hold everything they needed to know at once. So if they wanted to execute a certain maneuver, often they couldn't just say, you know, do number five. They had to type in 100 parameters for the thing to execute number five because it couldn't be stored. Did the, um, the families of these astronauts have an opportunity to come into NASA and to be able to speak with, you know, their family member that was up there? At any time? I believe so, but I, I can't say for sure. And I would say it was probably more likely on the longer duration missions than the shorter duration mission. I mean, Gus Grissom, four and a half hours, probably not. But, you know, Borman on level two weeks, I would I would hope so. But I, I, I can't say I know for sure. Certainly they, they watched the launch. I don't remember where I read it or saw it, but there was, there was something about families and what the wives of these astronauts would be going through during that time and um, maybe it was a movie or something but the, right you know, was that yeah. what it was yeah. the support yeah. or lack of support mm -hmm. that they would get mm -hmm. from from NASA yeah. yeah yeah you can the the book the right stuff and the movie the right stuff it, it's a little too tongue in cheek for my tastes and it really picks on Gus Grissom the movie <laughs> The movie more than the book. The book doesn't pick on quite so much. In the movie, they show him panicking and freaking out in his mere mercury capsule, and they say that's why the hatch blew. But there is a lot of good history in that movie if you want to watch it. And so far as the wives supporting each other, you know, one of the famous scenes is before Al Shepard is going up. They're all drinking tea, or Shepard's wife is saying, yeah, Al had five cups of coffee before he left for the pad. <laughs> and the thing is delayed, and you see Shepard really <laughs> needs to pee. <laughs> it's, it's very funny. Yeah. Yes, sir. I love your connection with Bell, and my son, as he told you, were connected to the space program and so on, life support. He, he would have to explain that. I don't understand why. But but uh, they had local connection. My father also worked for Bell during World War II, so I'm a little familiar with everything we have done in this area. And uh, I, it also brought to mind a friend who is in the community from another perspective of science, uh, Dr. Dick Lau, who's gonna be presenting at the JCC Book Fair on the 20th at six o'clock. He might even be a good speaker for us on the Byron Bergen dig site any of you familiar with that? Hundreds of people dug there in the archaeological site and uh, unearthed uh, quite a bit of uh, scientific information. And I think he'd be a good speaker for us if we're interested. I can speak to him. I think he'd love to do it. He also has just recently come out with a book. But it's a nice local connection, and I enjoyed yours and my family connection with it. Sure. The talk that I gave to the men's club before uh, <coughs> The road to the moon went through Western New York. It's all about those local connections, and we we talked to Carlton. Um, you know, one of the things at the end of that talk is the quote: uh, "At least through 1987, no American has breathed in space without a valve designed by George Ord, who is the chief designer at Carlton." I mean, think about that. Yeah. Yes, you were talking about the different ways of getting to the moon in the beginning, you know, the direct route, and so forth. From my memory, it was that the Russians tried the direct route, and they could never get that big boost to work properly. It was one of the reasons why we beat them there. Uh, and the other thing, of course, was one of the answers we had over the Russians what was on microelectronics. Mm -hmm. And so that was a real advantage that we had. We, we were definitely ahead there. Uh, if you want to learn more about the, the Russian program, I cannot recommend Siddiqui's book enough. And again, I'll I'd be happy to pass along the recording of Dr. Siddiqui's talk. Yes, sir. 
just, just a comment, if people are interested in this, I don't know how many people have seen it, there's an Apple TV show called For All Mankind, and it's, it's fiction, but it takes a lot of this stuff and, and talks about it, but it spins it, and it's if the Russians got to the moon first, and it changes the whole course of history, so it, it, it kind of got me, in, I started watching it, it got me interested in this stuff, and I was down in Houston for work and went to the Johnson, Museum there, you can see the Saturn rockets and some of these stuff. But if you if you don't mind not hearing seeing the truth, <laughs> from a fictional standpoint, it just it, it was a, it's a really interesting show. Yeah, my, my wife and I actually watch it. I, I tell people it's uh, poor history but very good drama. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't admit this to a temple crowd, but one aspect of For All Mankind is President Nixon also inaugurates a class of female astronauts. Mm -hmm very, like in the middle of the Apollo program. And I started calling it to my wife, I started referring to the show as Chicks in Space. <laughs> um, but one other thing, it, you have to get it on DVD, but Tom Hanks did a mostly truthful with a little fiction series 15 years ago called From the Earth to the Moon, uh, which is terrific. Terrific. You know, he invented a couple of little fictional characters to help move the story along, but everything portrayed so far as Gemini and Apollo uh, is is factual with the context of the drama. You know, they have a fake Walter Cronkite character who's talking about it throughout. But uh, from the Earth to the Moon is, is excellent. Just really good TV. The absolute theater. Oh, yes. I just wondered. Did you say you flew off carriers? No. No, 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 no. Uh, the worst thing we have to do in a C-130 is land on a 3,000 foot runway, whereas those Navy pilots land on a 1,000 foot ship that's moving. Ah, well, they really don't land, they sort of crash. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, no, never. Yes? Um, what excites you about what's going on now in space? Anything, uh, anything? Uh, the thing that excites me the most is that uh, SpaceX and Musk has made uh, launch to Earth orbit so routine, cheap, repeatable, rel cheap is a relative term, but that he reuses his boosters and, and just launches them so quickly and recovers them so reliably. That's, to the extent that I'm excited about what's going on now, I think that's, that's really, really cool. Uh, Space launch system and Artemis, you know, you look at that, it's just Apollo on steroids. And it's 50 years later and we still haven't done it. Uh, so I'll, I'll be glad when we go back to the moon, but the fact that we're doing it the same way so many years later is, is kind of a little disappointing. What I really hope, I, I'm worried that the last man who walked on the moon is going to pass away. Well, not the last man, because Gene Cernan was the last and he's already gone, but that all men who walked on the moon will be deceased before we have another one. That there'll be a period of time where there's no one alive who walked on the moon, and that's going to be a very sad stage for the United States with with respect to space exploration. What about the Starship? Are you keeping the Starship is is really interesting. I don't know a lot about it. The, the most interesting thing about the Starship, I really should read more about it, is because it's a lot like the direct descent vehicle. It's this big monster thing that's going to land on the moon and then go back. But the difference with the Starship is it's not going to, uh, it doesn't have to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. You know, it can, but it's, it's going to refuel at this lunar gateway. So, but I don't, I don't know a lot about it. I truly don't. Carol. From a, thank you, very interesting. From a process and a safety perspective, doing something that has never been done before in such a short time and having the agility to look at what you're doing and correct on the fly mm. and make it safer for the next time and add something and do something else, I, that just amazes me. And with the technology that they had in that day compared to this day, even more so. So I just wonder in the future, it's gonna be a lot easier in some ways, it's gonna be a lot more difficult in some ways, I think, but it's just, it, that just amazes me. In, in some ways, when you look at the time scale and the budget and what they accomplished, in, in some ways, Gemini is more impressive than Apollo, in some ways. 
and you mentioned budget. How much did all that cost? Just uh, in, in like today's dollars, any idea? Or I'm, I'm sure we could look it up. I, I don't remember that. It right now, $1.6 in linear dollars is popping into my head, but that could be totally wrong. But it was a, I, I will say it was a small fraction of what Apollo cost. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was somewhat on a shoestring compared to Apollo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Last question. Then, last question. Is there a realistic plan to get to Mars? What's the question? He's not going there. <laughs> Diane won't let a realistic him. plan to get to Mars. At I, I don't think we have any have any currently. Not not that I'm aware of. I mean, it's this lofty. Someday, maybe yeah, we'll kind of like Apollo was before Kennedy said before the decade is out. You know, because Apollo was launched before that speech, and it was just sort of this vague. Someday we'll do something somewhere. Um, yeah, my favorite quote, and we'll end with it. Elon Musk. Uh, <laughs> Uh, on Mars, he says uh, that he wants to die on Mars, just not on impact. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again. Well, thanks. There is some food left, so especially yeah, dessert, so we have it. Lots of orange juice. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Why don't thank